Okay, welcome back everyone uh, to the second part of the morning session. Uh, our speaker is Peter Miller from the University of Michigan and he will talk about dispersive shock waves in the Benjaminone equation. Peter. Thank, thank you for the introduction. Do you know if the people here in the microphone, is it working? It's not working for me. Is there an, is there an off, on off button? Oh. How about now? Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Switches. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gino, for the introduction. Um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, and thank you all for coming uh, to my talk. Thanks, Isaac, as well. Um, so uh, I would like to talk about um, the Benjamin Ono equation. It's a topic that I've been kind of obsessed with on and off for the last 15 years or so, and pretty much what happens is every time I get a good student, then I get excited about it again, and we work on it. And anyway, so we're kind of going through phases like that. And so um, um, let me see if I can get rid of this. OK, so, um, so I'm going to talk about some work with um, these are former students, um, Zheng Jiaxu and um, Alfredo Wetzel. And then I have uh, a current postdoc, Elliot Blackstone, who was a, a former student of Alex's. Um, and Louise Gasso, we're working on a, a new aspect of this problem now. So I'm excited about it again. Um, so let me tell you about it. OK. Great. So, um, so this is the Benjamin Ono equation down here. It's some asymptotic model that involves the Hilbert transform, written in this formula over here, um, taking the place of like what would be the third derivative in the KDV equation. So it's describing some kind of uh, dispersive correction to a Berger's equation. And it's uh, as a physical model, it shows up when you think about long um, one-dimensional weakly nonlinear internal waves. That, have a, a, that are propagating over a deep lower layer. So we have two fluids of different densities. There's a picnicline in between and it's moving around. And the, the function u of xt is like the vertical height of the picnicline at location x in time t. So um, anyway, one of the things that this, that this uh, equation and this kind of physical phenomenon is supposed to describe is something called the morning glory cloud. Um, so this is one that, that appeared in um, Michigan where I, where I live. Um, in, uh, in 2015. So you can see it's kind of a long uh, cloud that looks like a, a tube. And that tube is like a solitary wave. It's supposed to be a solitary wave of the Benjamin Ono equation. Okay. And somehow it attracts some moisture, which is why um, you can see it like that. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the morning glory. Um, and then another picture that you can, if you sort of Google this thing, you can find on the internet um, is this kind of picture. So this is taken from an airplane. You can see and so now there's uh, several of these morning glory clouds um, stacked one after the other after the other. So it's some kind of a train of morning glory clouds, okay? So um, anyway, so the Benjamin Ono equation is really good at making things like that happen. Um, I, have a, um, I have a simulation of it. So this is, a, this is a simulation. Actually, it's not. It's an exact solution, as I maybe will explain later, with this initial data here and this value of this parameter epsilon that throughout this talk I'm gonna think of as being a small number. So epsilon is 0 0.1, and here's the right half of the initial data, and I think I will run the movie now. And so you see that bump moves to the right, and it produces a whole bunch of these little morning glory clouds like that, and so it it's really it seems like it might be a good model for this um, phenomenon. Okay, so, so this kind of um, production out of a single bump of several other bumps like that, is something that's kind of a familiar topic to a lot of us. It's something called the formation of a dispersive shock wave. So um, basically, the idea is that this epsilon in our in our equation is a small parameter, and so really there's kind of um, there, there's kind of some two phases really of the dynamics, if you like. So when time is is not too big, you start out with a smooth initial condition u naught of x like that. And basically, you should be able to drop the Hilbert transform and solve this Berger's equation, and that's that's the solution for a while. But the problem is that um, the problem is that Berger's um, equation with some bump initial data like this, some nice bump, the bump is going to fold over. It's going to form a vertical tangent at some point, and and then when that happens, um, well, the differential equation will stand up and bark at you because there's a Hilbert transform that you forgot, and you have to take that into account. And that's really what forms all of these all of these morning glory clouds. Okay, so the shock will shed oscillations of order one amplitude and order epsilon in wavelength. So lots of these things when epsilon is very small. And really, it's a dispersive response to large gradients that appear um, sort of in the Berger solution. OK, so, <clears throat> so how do we um, describe this kind of thing? Well, the, the dispersive shock wave, this train of, 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 you know, of pulses of solitary waves, 
it really resembles a kind of slowly modulated periodic traveling wave. So we may think about Widom's modulation theory. He kind of came up with this idea in 1965, and there are so many experts here, I, I'm embarrassed to talk about it, but I'll just say that he had a, a way of defining some kind of a description for how these, these, these trains should, should evolve in time. And, and uh, what happens is that, well, uh, it works really great for differential equations. The Benjamin Ono equation has this non-locality through the Hilbert transform, so you gotta modify the, the approach a little bit. This was all carried out in this uh, paper by um, Dilbrook Hodov and Kreechever in 1991. I'll flash the actual references at the end if you're interested to take a picture of it or something for your, um, uh, for your uh, uh, references. But anyway, so they, they, they used this kind of Widom approach, but they had to adapt it to Benjamin Ono. So let me tell you a little bit about what they found in their paper. Um, so, so the first thing that they found in their paper is a family of exact solutions that represent periodic traveling waves, okay? So not only that, but they found um, multi-phase waves. So for any P that's like a, a, a one, two, three, et cetera, the Benjamin Ono equation admits multi-phase waves with P phases, and these are parameterized by some constants that are called betas in the paper. So beta zero, beta one through beta two P. So there's two P plus one of them, okay? And, um, and these, these uh, are the basic constants, and there are also some phases. So there are P phase variables, constants as well. So, so the exact solutions that they found in their paper by some kind of KP um, reduction method have this really amazing property that, that they're all rational functions of just some simple um, oscillating factors, some simple, simple exponentials. So these are exponentials built out of the differences of consecutive betas as like the, the wave number, the frequency over here, there's the phase shift coming in. So that's it. So you take these exponentials and you build like a matrix out of them and you calculate its determinant and that, that is actually the solution. So it's a rational function of, of these exponentials. A lot simpler than what you usually expect in KDV, for instance, where you have uh, Riemann theta functions of arbitrary genus. Here, they're all just um, rational functions of exponentials. Okay, so that was the first interesting uh, discovery. And then the second part of it um, has to do with the modulation theory. So you have to do the averaging of these oscillations and figure out how the waves should propagate sort of in bulk. And when you do that, um, you find the Widom equations. So here's what the Widom equations actually are for the system. They are completely uncoupled. So these betas here become functions of X and T in the Widom theory. And they evolve according to independent copies, in this case, of just the inviscid Berger's equation. So there's no coupling at all. Each beta does its own thing, and they all satisfy exactly the same PDE. It's just the, the Berger's equation. Pretty amazing, because you know, for, for KDV, what happens is you'd replace this two beta K by some function built out of elliptic integrals that couples all the betas together. All right, maybe hyperelliptic integrals for the multi-beta case. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture. I guess I didn't mention where beta zero shows up here. That's like the mean, it's like the average somehow. So these are just the differences of the next ones. Okay, so that's what they found in, in uh, 1991. And then you can start to use that, that approach to try to describe you know, what happens to waves. So there was this uh, gravich pitayevsky paper for KDV in 1974. Um, that said how you, how you should try to use these Widom equations to describe like, okay, you know, a step. How does a step evolve? Something like that. How does the shock appear? That was the gurevich pitayevsky paper. And so you can sort of modify that approach in light of these very simple Widom equations that Dobrokhodov and Kreechever uh, described um, to describe some kind of dispersive shock wave. So that was done in a couple papers. So Matsuno considered like the step very much like the gurevich pitayevsky problem. And, and he found the global solution in terms of modulated um, P phase waves, where P is either zero, well, that just means you have the Berger's equation, it's like neglecting the dispersion, and P equals one, so periodic traveling waves. But, um, but um, the next year, there was this paper um, in which um, they considered more general initial data, not just a pure step, um, and then they found solutions that had um, P could be zero, one, or even two. So two is like some kind of you know, combination of two counterpropagating traveling waves, some nonlinear a combination of them. Okay, so you can kind of patch together the Widom equations like that and figure out what happens. So um, another aspect um, of dispersive um, waves that are sort of, sort of interesting is this notion of universality. So here the idea is you sort of zoom in on the gradient catastrophe point, you know, and this is going to not be a gradient catastrophe for the dispersive problem. Some waves are going to pop out of that, and the question is what happens? What do you see right there at, near the catastrophe point? 
So uh, Dubrovin in 2006 um, uh, did some kind of um, Hamiltonian uh, perturbation theory, really. And he, he thought about just general dispersive corrections of this um, inviscid Burgers equation. And what he, what he claimed was that um, the, the general solutions of the general equation, so it not, doesn't depend on initial data, it doesn't depend on what you put over here to some degree anyway, um, should all be described near that gradient catastrophe point by exactly the same thing. It's some particular solution of the second equation in the Panlevé one hierarchy. And then the, this result, which was, it was kind of a, a, a conjecture really, it was proven um, in the special case that you perturb this by the KDV uh, term. So you put the third derivative over here with an epsilon squared, and that was in this paper of Tom Kleiss and, and Tamara Grava. So they, they, they proved that that really is true. It doesn't depend on initial data. Um, it would be very interesting if you could show that it does not depend on the equation either, and there are some numerical results in that direction, but not, not a proof yet. Okay, so what about Benjamin Ono? That's a dispersive correction somehow to Berger's, but it's not really the kind of thing that Boris um, Dubrovin thought about. It doesn't fit into his universality class. So it's a different kind of thing. The Hilbert transform is non-local, and you have to do something different. So um, there is a paper in the literature. There's this paper of uh, Mazuero, Raimondo, and Antunes, um, where they, they generalize, really, the, the analysis that Dubrovin did, this kind of perturbation theory. Um, and their, their analysis includes lots of non-local equations, intermediate long wave equation, and then sort of as a limiting case, the Benjamin Ono equation. And, and they postulate in their paper that, um, that if you look at the general solutions of this universality class near the gradient catastrophe point, what you should see instead is like, well, it, it's some kind of a, a particular solution of, all I can say is it's some kind of non-local analog of this um, second uh, equation in the first uh, Panlevé hierarchy. So, so it's like, I, I don't know, it's, I, I don't know how to describe it to you because I think it's kind of not proved really. It's a, it's a, it's a hypothesis, but it's, it's based on, um, on a, a perturbation theory along the lines of what Dubrovin did. So anyway, so that's an interesting thing to try to get to the bottom of. So if you were gonna put this, this particular um, conjecture here and other formal um, results of the Widom theory that you get by just patching together the different, the different uh, solutions of Berger's equation, um, if you wanted to put that stuff on solid footing, what you should try to do is to study the initial value problem, the Cauchy problem for the Benjamin Ono equation, um, and, and then take this limit when the epsilon goes to zero because that's what produces this Widom uh, approximation somehow. So, so we could do that because this is an integrable equation in principle. It's got an inverse scattering transform, an IST, and so we could try to turn the crank and find out what happens, okay? All right, so, well, so, whoops, too fast. <clears throat> Try again. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, on my screen, it's showing up correctly, but it's not the same thing that's over there. Is it possible, Nathan? Where's Nathan? Okay. Um, I'll just tell you. So, <laughs> so, um, so there is a lax pair for this equation. It was discovered by uh, Bach and Kruskal. And basically, that lax pair involves the spectral theory of a certain self-adjoint um, operator, which is non-local because the equation is non-local. It's, it's basically this thing over here. So this is just a minus i epsilon d by dx. So that's just the self-adjoint uh, first derivative, really. Um, and then over here, what you have is um, multiplication by the initial condition function, u naught of x. But, but you can't just do that directly. You have to first project onto the upper onto analytic functions in the upper half plane. So that's a, the Cauchy projection. So you, that's, an, that's an integral operator. You, you, you act with that first, then you multiply by u0, and then you do it again to get back into this Hardy space. That's the idea. It's called toplets. It's a toplets operator, ab absolutely, right. Uh, so anyway, um, right, so, so what you can try to do is to use this inverse scattering transform, hopefully, based on this um, operator to, you know, to try to get information. And I'll just mention that um, the original paper about this is, is, is here, and there were numerous subsequent um, developments on this, um, on this problem. But, um, but what, it, what it says at the bottom, and you can't see because of this, uh, this, this uh, 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 yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so that's different from that. That's all I can say. Yeah. Uh, no. There should be a little hand at the bottom, a little red hand.
What it says at the bottom here, by the way, is that the, um, this, this, this inverse scattering transform is actually not well defined yet. I mean, somehow there's lots of papers about it. People are doing amazing things with it, but there are gaps in the argument that are really important. And, and in particular, this uh, person, um, Yilun Wu, has, has interesting papers that are, um, that are uh, addressing this, this, uh, this issue. Okay, I'm gonna try to go on anyway, see if I can go ahead. Um, okay, so, I, okay. Okay. Sure. I don't know. So it's not uh, the, the I don't I, I yeah, well to be honest I can't tell from the paper but um no, from the paper not for sure. I was yeah. wondering whether you keep track of the evolution if anybody has a Yeah, so I yeah. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all great questions for the future. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so there's the lax pair, right? So, so this is, the, yeah, so this is the scattering problem written in some way that it appeared in the original paper. There's the spectral parameter. And this W plus and W minus are supposed to be functions of X that admit analytic extensions into the upper and lower complex half planes, respectively. And here is the potential, okay? That's sort of the scattering problem. Okay. Yeah, good. So, um, so as I mentioned, there's lots of work still to be done. Uh, the IST theory is actually a, a kind of work in progress for this problem. But what we could try to do anyway is, is follow it. So we could try to compute the spectral data, some eigenvalues, norming constants, or they're called a phase constants in this problem, and some reflection coefficient uh, for this operator acting on the Hardy space of the upper half plane. Hardy was from Cambridge, so we can be comfortable with that idea. Um, anyway, and, um, and then we should solve the inverse scattering problem, which is some kind of a differential uh, Riemann-Hilbert problem or integrated Riemann-Hilbert problem, which is quite, quite similar actually to the direct problem um, in some formal sense. And then we try to find this U of XT in terms of the time evolved scattering data. So even though it's still a work in progress, we just go ahead anyway um, and see what we can find out. So, so we should try to analyze the Cauchy problem for small epsilon. And we take initial data that doesn't depend on this small parameter epsilon. And the first thing we should try to do is to solve this direct problem, figure out what we can say about the spectral data for this, for this problem. So, so here's a really remarkable and interesting fact, uh, unusual again for Benjamin Ono. So the scattering data can actually be found more or less explicitly, like in closed form for all epsilon positive, it doesn't matter, um, if this U naught is a rational function of X. That's very interesting. So the first observation that I know about this um, that motivated us really was this Kodama, Abluitz, and Satsuma paper. They, they talk about this special case. It's just like the Lorentzian profile. And what they showed is that, okay, if epsilon is, is one over N, which is going to zero, of course, but anyway, one over N like that, then the eigenvalues are just basically scaled roots of the nth Laguerre polynomial, okay? So, so that's what I mean by like an exact representation of the, of the eigenvalues, right? You, you have something that you know about and you look at, the, at its roots, and then with Wetzel, my, my former student, Alfredo Wetzel, we generalized the computation um, to, to completely uh, arbitrary rational functions U naught that have simple poles in the complex plane and gave formulas for all the things you need, the reflection coefficient, the phase constants are called gamma j that belong to the eigenvalues lambda j, just like that. And, and, um, and so what's coming out of our, of our paper with Wetzel is that, okay, in general, what you get is like um, an Evans function that determines the eigenvalues and it's a P by P determinant if you've got P poles in your initial condition. And that doesn't matter what epsilon is. So however small it is, it's always P by P. You find the determinant and you set it to zero and that's how you find the eigenvalues. So anyway, one of the things you can do with this is you can use the resulting exact formulas um, to analyze them what happens in the limit when epsilon is small and really find out the asymptotics of the, of the spectral data. Um, so, um, so here's kind of what the results look like. So we assume uh, for convenience really that the U naught is a rational function and it's got a kind of bump shape like that. And that means that at any level uh, minus lambda, so lambda is gonna be a negative number like an eigenvalue for this problem. So at any positive level minus lambda, you've got two pre-images um, which are called turning points. So X minus of lambda and X plus of lambda. So what we find um, by direct analysis on this kind of potential um, is that the reflection coefficient tends to zero as epsilon goes to zero for all lambda positive. So that was like in Tamara's talk, she mentioned that that happens in the KDV problem as well. Um, so it's happening in Benjamin Ono as, as well. 
um, the asymptotic density of negative eigenvalues is given by a, a kind of vial law. Look how simple it is in this problem. It's just one over two pi times the difference between these two points. It's this distance right here. That's it. That's the density of eigenvalues at level minus lambda for this problem. Okay, um, so then you can also work out the spacing, of course, epsilon over this f of lambda. And this density function actually was predicted in an earlier paper of Matsuno. He's using kind of trace formulas. It's not a rigorous computation, but the same formula uh, can be found there. And then what about these phase constants? Those are not in the trace formulas, but the phase constant gamma j for an eigenvalue lambda j is given a, by this kind of approximate formula. You evaluate this function. This is just the average of those turning points with a minus sign. You evaluate that thing um, at the eigenvalue, and that gives you an approximation of the actual phase constant that you need for the inverse algorithm. Okay, so that's what. So where ratio analysis play a role? Uh, so, so as I was talking about, you, you sort of set up a um, well, it's 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 a, a contour integrals, right? So you everything can be done by contour integration and residues, and you have these finite expressions, and that's where these kind of p by p determinants are coming from. Maybe that's an explanation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, so, so if we take a positive bump initial condition, um, the reflection coefficient is going to be small. We have good predictions for the eigenvalues and the phase constants. So it's natural to drop that reflection coefficient. And that's a good thing to do because even though the inverse scattering transform has got all kinds of things that are not known about it, um, if you don't have a reflection coefficient, it makes total sense. And so you have a, a linear algebra problem, very similar to what um, Tamara described. And when you solve that by Kramer's rule, you get this determinantal formula for the solution. So two epsilon d by dx, imaginary part of log tau, and tau is the determinant of this, um, of this matrix, identity plus i over epsilon times a, and a is Hermitian. A is a Hermitian matrix. The diagonal entries involve the phase constants and then x and t in this, kind of, in this, in this way. And the diagonal elements involve just the um, eigenvalues and epsilon in this way. So that's, a, that's the n soliton formula, if you like, for, for the Benjamin Ono equation. And now we know what to sort of put in for these gammas and the lambdas and so on, and that's sort of the game. So we're gonna approximate the initial data like this. We're gonna let u naught be a given um, initial condition, positive, single maximum, and rapidly decaying. Um, and then for given um, epsilon positive, we define a, a different function, a, a, a u tilde of xt in the following way. So first of all, we um, take the mass of our initial condition and we quantize it by epsilon like this. This is the integer part of m over epsilon. That's a number of approximate eigenvalues by definition n. And then we have these turning points, x minus and x plus. And so the asymptotic density of eigenvalues, uh, we, we may recall, was given by this formula. So we're going to quantize that next. So we take the integral from minus L up to, uh, minus L is the minimum of this thing, up to lambda tilde and of our density, and we quantize that by epsilon times half of an integer. And that's how we're going to get some numbers lambda tilde. By the way, this total integral is just the mass because we integrate left, left right versus up, down. It's the same thing, same area under the curve. I learned that in calculus. Okay, so, um, and then um, in accordance with our rigorous result for rational um, u naught, we're going to define a corresponding approximate approximation of the phase constant, we'll call it gamma n tilde, by just plugging in our approximate, um, our approximate eigenvalues into this formula. That's what we're going to do. So now we have a bunch of lambda tildes, gamma tildes, okay, and what we're going to do is use that to build a function u tilde out of this um, determinant. That's what we do. So we call that u tilde and that's our, our exact solution of Benjamin Ono that we're going to study. So I have to say, it's not exactly the same thing as the solution of the Cauchy problem, um, but, but, but it does solve the Benjamin Ono equation for every um, epsilon, and it also is pretty close to, to u uh, naught at time zero. As it happens, it's a lot easier to analyze it. So that's what we're going to study. Okay, so the, here, here's the theorem from uh, my, my first student on this project. So it involves the weak limit. So first of all, let um, u naught through u two p be just the branches of the multi-valued solution of Berger's equation. Here's a picture, okay? So here's u zero, u one, and u two, and then here you just have a u zero. Out here you just have a u zero. And so what we're saying is that um, is that the, the the solution, this u tilde function, the solution of Benjamin Ono, converges in the weak L two sense. That means you integrate against a test function, and the integrals converge for any test function. Um, it converges to just the alternating sum of these UKs. So you just add them up with signs, plus, minus, plus. That's the limit. 
That's what you get out by taking epsilon to zero. And a corollary of the proof is that the convergence is actually strong, um, so you can really do like local uniform convergence if t is also small enough that there's a that the Berger's equation has not broken. It's a classical solution. Okay, so um, well, I had sort of thought about. Um, I, I'm going to tell you this. It's based on this result, which is that um, is that we know something about the eigenvalues of this matrix A. So the whole thing is kind of a, a, a some kind of a version of Lax and Levermore's theory for KDV. So we have everything here except the derivative in our in our um, for, in our solution of uh, Benjamin Ono. Everything but the x derivative is standing here, and this has a locally uniform limit that's just given by the integral of the signum function times pi against some measure with a density, and the density is completely explicit. It's just given by this formula G here that's built out of the x plus and minus, and um, and that's it. So. Um, so let me um, try to indicate why this is coming up. So if you take the, this twice uh, epsilon imaginary log tau, um, that's just written in terms of eigenvalues of, of A. If, if alphas are the eigenvalues of A, it's written by this formula. And here you can just take the imaginary part of the log as an arctan, right? So you have, ar you have an arctan of one over epsilon times some alphas. That's something that's gonna concentrate and become a, a signum function in the limit. So if I knew the distribution of these alphas, well, that would be pretty good. And so that's what this G is. This G that I showed you on the last slide is just the density of these alphas. And so here's just a, some histograms to kind of show you how that works. And you see that, okay, things really are filling up. And, and then this black curve is exactly the graph of this function G. Okay, so the eigenvalues of the matrix A are really filling out according to this, this function G. And so um, I'm not going to tell you about the proof, but it's based on what it's based on is some kind of completely deterministic version of Wigner's moment method. So you just look at traces of powers and use lots of structure, but I don't have the time to show it to you. So um, I'll just skip it, okay? Um, but anyway, um, it's something about the periodic case. So it, by contrast with this whole line situation, um, the periodic IST is perfect, actually. It was worked out in full details by uh, Gerard and Kapler just um, last year, it was published. So it's a beautifully complete IST theory based on the Birkhoff transform. And using this theory, um, Louise Gasseau wrote a paper where she um, applied sort of some asymptotic analysis to this theory and produced um, uh, sort of periodic versions of all of these, um, these theorems I mentioned. So again, the weak the small dispersion limit is just the alternating sum of branches of Berger's equation. But in the periodic setting, this, these things can fold over infinitely often. So it's really quite interesting, but that's what happens. So, okay, there's not a lot of time left, but I'll just do a couple slides here about our, um, our current work. So we're trying to strengthen the convergence. We want to capture the oscillations. Those are missed by this kind of weak convergence where we're averaging somehow locally. And so what makes our convergence weak in these papers here is that we're taking a derivative um, after we take the limit, which is a bad idea. We should try to take the derivative first and then pass to the limit and see what we can get. That's the idea. So, um, so one formula you can get if you differentiate first is this one. So the same u tilde function can be written as this finite sum of, actually this is really just the shape of the, of the soliton for Benjamin Ono, but the soliton is centered at a point, a moving point mu k of t, and it's got it's like amplitude um, nu k of t. And those things are the, uh, are the real and imaginary parts of the complex eigenvalues of this matrix here. So B is a, is a, a Hermitian matrix that only depends on t, and then there's this um, non-Hermitian perturbation like that. So, um, so B has got elements. It looks kind of like the A matrix, but there's no X here. It only depends on T. And then there's this part that we're going to add in as a non-Hermitian correction. So um, OK, so you could make pictures of those eigenvalues. These are the, the complex eigenvalues of this matrix for different times. This is before the break. This is right at the breaking time for burgers, and this is after. And, and most of these eigenvalues are kind of, they're kind of up here, and they, they, they are converging to the real line. You know, numerically, it looks like that. The distance is like epsilon log epsilon, okay? And the spacing in the horizontal direction is proportional to epsilon. And if you sort of take those into account, what you get is like the Riemann, the sum is like a Riemann sum of an integral. And that, that integral reproduces the, the Berger solution. So that looks pretty good. But then when breaking happens, you see there's, it's hard to see, but there's some little tail over here that sneaks down. And that tail is much closer to the real line. It's like order epsilon distance. And um, the interval where that tail lives is precisely the interval in which the solution of Berger's equation is multi-valued, okay? So these eigenvalues here, if you take those into account, that somehow is describing the fluctuations, the oscillations. So that's pretty good. 
Um, the trouble is that we don't know how to prove any of these these observations because this matrix is not Hermitian. So we're talking about the you know distribution of eigenvalues of some complex uh, complex matrix. So here's a different formula. You can also write this one just in terms of the eigenvalues of the self-adjoint matrix A um, and their derivatives with respect to X, unfortunately. So that's also there. So one thing you can show is that this, this alpha derivative is always bounded. And so there's really no contributions to this um, sum at all unless one of these alphas is small. So as to cancel this one over epsilon squared. So you gotta look for like small eigenvalues of A. Those drive the whole formula actually in this situation. And if you think about it, well, the density, this G, I, I flashed some picture of it. It has a peak at zero. That means that there's infinite density of eigenvalues at alpha equals zero, eigenvalues of A at alpha equals zero. And, and so what it means is that there's a lot of eigenvalues there and numerically they're all moving to the right slowly. And so we call that the traffic jam. There's a traffic jam of eigenvalues. And if you take those into account in this formula, that's a Riemann sum again, it gives you some slowly varying function like a, like a, a mean value. But, um, but there's also, if you're in the multi-valued region, this A matrix has some other eigenvalues near the origin as well. There are some sort of faster moving ones that form a less dense grid. So I have a, I'm gonna run the movie and then I have to slow it down because it's gonna go too fast. But this is a picture of a point in the XT plane. This is the multi-valued region for burgers. And here are a bunch of eigenvalues near, near zero. So watch what happens and then I'll try to slow it down after I run it. So, okay, so some crazy stuff going on, but I will drag it back. Okay, finished, so let's, let's go back. So you see, you see what's happening here. Here's the boring part. So there's just the traffic jam happening. And then when we cross into this region, look what's happening now. That traffic jam is also being in, interrupted by these, these eigenvalues that are passing through the traffic like this, one at a time, right? Those eigenvalues are gonna be responsible for producing each one of them a blip like that, right? That's the periodic wave. So at the moment, um, what we're saying is we can describe all this stuff by just looking at the eigenvalues of the matrix A with great precision. It's a Hermitian matrix. So we're suspecting that things are easier to prove here. We actually have some preliminary results that I'm not gonna tell you about, but anyway, it's all an ongoing project. We need a lot of details, but it's sort of all there. Okay, so um, well, Widom theory references, um, the universality references, here's the, the paper that I mentioned for, for Benjamin Ono, this paper of Mazuero, Raimondo, and Antunis. Um, IST, the papers of Wu here are the ones where he's sort of pointing out the difficulties in establishing lots of the useful properties. Here's the periodic transform paper. And, um, uh, and it's not working anymore. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> thank you, Peter. <laughs> we have time for maybe one quick question. So when you, well, so we don't, in the picture, we're Sorry. not going through the cusp, we're passing through the boundaries, but when you pass through the boundaries, what happens is that some new eigenvalues start streaming into the picture and they are, um, they, they have more space in between them, okay? So the density is like finite instead of infinite at the origin, and they are also moving faster. So they're, they're trying to overtake the, the, the traffic jam eigenvalues, but they never collide, actually. The eigenvalues seem not to collide, so they just repel, and they, they, look, they look like solitons, actually. They kind of try to repel, and then the next one moves faster. It's, it's something like that. But maybe you were asking what happens at the vertex. Is that what maybe you're asking? Oh, right? yeah, I didn't do that experiment. But, but of course, that's exactly the point where you'd want to take this matrix A and completely understand its eigenvalues, and then you would have some representation of what the actual, uh, what, what the actual transition function should be, right? That's, a, that's what we want to do. <laughs> Ideas would be very welcome. So. Uh, okay, thank you, Peter. Let's thank Peter again. And let's move on to our next speaker, which is Alexei Rybkin.